Hello again and welcome to the Fragile Existence Development Diary number 18. Uh, as you can see I'm trying something a little bit different here and uh, I decided that instead of hearing a disembodied voice you can now see me as I guide you through these uh, <laughs> development diaries. I know what a treat right? Uh, anyway um, what has been happening in the last three months since I last put a development diary up? I'm glad you asked. So if we put down to the bottom here I will bring up the Steam page. The process for getting on Steam is is exhaustive and um, yeah, it takes a lot of messing around. Obviously, I can't show you behind the scenes because it's all uh, non-disclosure and all that, but generally filling all this in takes takes quite a bit of time, getting everything right, um, you know, even just filling in the basics. Uh, this is also me saying, hey guys, I'm on Steam now. Um, obviously, you can't buy it yet. Plan release date is 2022 probably going to be into early access at the end of the year we'll see and uh, the also have the developer page here as well if you want to check that out and go to the links from there it takes you to the web page web page has been renovated as well since the last sort of um caught you guys up and there's a lot of information on there about the game if you want to catch up with things um going to like the actual gameplay and that kind of thing and um for those of you who don't necessarily like discord i decided to embrace the steam community page and so uh, the link to that is up there and of course the Discord, come and join us on Discord, that's generally the easiest way to get information these days. Um, but uh, apart from that, I also took place, uh, sorry, I always also um, took part in the Gamescom 2021, um, I think August the 25th, and so this is Gamescom now, and as you can see, I had a booth right next to Fallen Frontier, can't, can't be bad, can it, really? Um, I got to level 48, I couldn't get to level 50, very annoying, uh, it was some sort of bug, um, <laughs> yeah I guess I gotta let that go, uh, we get rid of this, we go back into the game, um, I like to bring you right to the start just to show you, um, you know, I'm not really trimming anything out, this is what it is, and um, we go straight to the creation organiser as I generally do, I do have a development um, scenario sort of ready to go, um, but if I just sort of hop in and start with the gas plant, how about that? Let's call it gassy. Why not? You know. <laughs> and if we go into the planet editor for gassy, um, you'll see I've done some work on gas plants, which weren't actually uh, a feature three months ago when it was my last development day. And um, here's a very boring looking gas planet. Uh, we can change the radius, of course. I mean, if it's going to be a gas plant, it's got to be huge, right? Uh, it's got an atmosphere, but we, we generally want to make that a bit thinner, which we do like this. Still looks very uninteresting, obviously, um, but when we go to the texturing, I've got essentially a, a sort of procedural engine here, which allows us to generate gas planets. Um, it's in a very early stage. You can see it's sort of, uh, the, the way the colours are blending is still a little bit rough, uh, but generally I think this is a good start for the gas planets. Um, you know, um, fairly convincing the idea is there's going to be a, a haze or a sort of volumetric haze over the top of this so that um it, it will look less i don't know i don't know uh, sharp sharp yeah let's go with that it looked more blended and a lot more volumetric uh but i haven't got around to that yet um and you can sort of see roughly what the size sort of profile looks like here and you know we can tweak these settings and we can change the colors and yeah, I, I don't want to linger on this too much, but you, you get the idea. We've got gas plants. Gas plants are in now, so that's good. Um, but if we back out of there, the big change that there has been, apart from all the other stuff that I've had to work on uh, with the Steam page and the Gamescom and all that kind of thing, is um, I've completely redone the train engine. So the original train engine, um, if I start with the Rocky, um, <laughs> got them original. And. Um, the original train engine was completely flat. Now the idea was that if it was flat, it meant that the movement systems were very, very simple. So uh, the actual sort of the math being done frame by frame was very, very straightforward, which meant you'd be able to have tons of units. And so my brain was thinking, okay, let's just have a flat surface with no train detailing, no sort of like, you know, um, elevation or descending or anything like that. And it didn't look very good let's be honest like i was doing those mountains and i was doing them as features obviously the trees and the buildings and all that kind of thing as well but mountains that were quite detailed texture wise but 
very low polygon didn't really help me at all uh, so um, the new train engine is working on the earth-like planet and the rocky planets so far uh, of course there's going to be other planet types like frozen planets desert planets ice planets you know all the staples of sci-fi really <laughs> and so um, in the generation stage of the rocky planet we can change the crater density which isn't particularly obvious here I, I will admit and then the variation is showing where we want the sandy area which is the, the sort of the lighter color and the so like the rocky area of the rocky planet <laughs> anyway <laughs> and so uh, by let's get rid of the ring by moving on from here what we will actually see is the new train engine now what it does is it places brushes and updates the height map um, essentially in real time but you see it has a little bit there and um, so now we've got craters we've got a variety of different craters and we've got a variety of different mountain shape on the more mountain area if I go to the placement mode you'll see it it re um, it resubmits all that information and um, we can now zoom in at least so you can see perhaps there's a lot more detail I can't change the camera angle so it's all straight down at the moment but there's a lot more normal mapping on the ground and there's a lot more uh, sort of variation in elevation profile and it's still actually loading the maps as we go on and it's updating each one here that's why it was stuttering um, and so um, you know it because the camera's zooming in quite a bit there it doesn't necessarily look very nice um, but what you see what you're seeing here it isn't textures it's actually the mesh being deformed and so the actual quad the the overall detail of each planet has gone up quite a bit um, and I know this is a very gray looking planet which isn't very interesting but in terms of what we can now do on the surface and just bake it into the mesh we're basically it's basically unlimited and, and we were really wasting um, polygons before because we were placing those mountains down but we weren't getting rid of the ground surface underneath it um, so it was basically rendering that mesh uh, a relatively high detail anyway the planet mesh itself and um, the um, the actual little meshes for the little mountains were each individually being placed as well uh, so a little bit messy um, very inefficient way of doing things um, the rocky planets look a lot better I think and um, we'll show you some colored ones later on I want to save that um, we come out and um, I guess we need to see an earth planet but instead of going into the planet editor I'll just jump straight into the Cowabunga system which has six planets two earth like two rocky uh, two gas if I just go briefly into the solar system editor because I keep skipping this it's a crucial part of the whole system really we place the star and we place the planets uh, in relation to each other we got the entry here which is dictated by the green triangle that's where we're going to jump in we're going to jump into North Dakota, it's about 300,000 kilometers out and um, and you can see these connections that the connections dictate how the ships can move from world to world if that's not clear so planets don't orbit the Sun uh, in this game uh, they don't even rotate actually although they may do uh, at some point point. Um, and so the lines the, the sort of the warp lines that we have here are essentially ways of creating bottlenecks uh, which hopefully makes for I don't know some tactical scenarios I, I'd like to think uh, but anyway so that's what the system looks like let's dive into it and um, actually get some ships and get the fleet built up and uh, we're currently the edit button loads the scenario that's just what I've been doing uh, eventually it'll be in a separate scenario section um, we bring up the fleet and the other big change and it is quite a drastic change it doesn't sound like much um, is what I call the great rescaling and so the train engine's been completely redone from the ground up uh, and that uh, refers to the ground of the uh, sorry the ground surface of the planets um, but the rescaling is about making the ship smaller making the units smaller all the things that are on the planet smaller making the planets bigger and make the planets feel bigger uh, so I think a common not complaint but common comment I saw really was related to how um, planets seem very small and very cartoony and um, and I think that's a valid complaint like but um, 
terms of what we can actually sort of achieve in terms of what memory we have and how graphics cards and how much they can render that kind of thing um, I was really playing it safe and I've tried to really push the envelope a bit more now they are bigger they're not to true scale obviously that's ridiculous we can't do that um, but you know here we are rendering in um, the entire procedural system six planets uh, with a fleet here that we have and you can see how we can select individual ships and something that's actually new is we can now uh, multi-select with using the shift key I mean it's pretty much a staple in RTS right we can do the same up here uh, so this is the the fleet overview it's actually quite new um, newer than the last devlog and if we bring up the fleet panel we can actually see the ships that we've got selected and deselected and you can see we can do it any which way doesn't sound like much but kind of important and so the fleet overview is going to show us what uh, ships we currently got selected and generally this panel is for sort of overview sort of panels I guess um, the approaching destination system all hands brace for imminent cascade breach. Uh, so that announces that we've uh, we're about to exit warp, um, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. It's having a little bit at the moment. I think it's because I've got a few things running in the background. But um, we've got the system map. It's sort of slightly upgraded since the last time I showed you. And if we zoom back in, you know, obviously we can focus individual units as we normally do and so our starting fleet are these five units we have the heavy transporter in fact we have the same as we had last time i believe so the geneva class cruiser the strike carrier the support carrier and the daedalus class frigate uh, frigate <laughs> and so the support carrier of course can carry units and support vehicles the support vehicles are now up here and um, each individual subunit can be selected like so. So if they're not actually deployed yet, you can actually bring up the information about each individual thing whilst it's still stocked aboard the ship. I thought that was quite important because you could end up having uh, like all your units on board ships and being like, well, how do I interact with all the modules and like their inventories and that kind of thing. So, you know, here we are, we just sort of access their inventories from here and I can actually, um, add to the inventory 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 uh, I'm here by uh, just uh, randomly placing some items into the inventory this is what it looks like inventory is new as well so we're we're covering things as we go along um, so we got three resources here and uh, obviously if we move to another ship we get rid of that storage um, you may have noticed that the supply over here is also updating and this is actually sorted as well and uh, if we have multiple ships selected um, this um, this is basically the fleet inventory um, but it's only what you've got selected I thought that was quite important um, because you didn't know sometimes you'll, you'll want to see everything in the fleet sometimes you want to see uh, over here for example what just one ship has got but over here you'll be able to sort of select a group and you'll know um, uh, information about that particular group will update on the right hand side so it's, uh, it's sort of an overview but only uh, of what you want to look at which I think is quite important uh, let's change the background and uh, if we zoom forward to the first planet we still got the first Earth flight planet with the new train engine looks like now I think it's a massive improvement from what we had before um, let's actually get some ships in orbit and move some stuff around so we can actually get the camera down and we'll move some of our golems into place as well there we go and so we zoom in you can see i hope you can see the result of the rescaling so uh, the planes are a lot bigger than they used to be um, which in fact ultimately just means that everything else is shrunk but it has the same effect, so that's fine. Uh, so you see the, uh, the ships moving away as they normally do. And uh, we'll just drop the Centurion. And straight away, we can move around. Now, the power finding system is adapted to the new terrain engine. So we can actually go anywhere. 
and it automatically works out as you see it's powerful around the lakes uh, it has no issue with that apparently there's a little ambridge there and you know i'm just adding waypoints here with m uh, and we can go wherever we want and if we try to go to a continent we can't cross to it'll find the nearest possible position so uh pathfinding is working pretty well and it calculates behind the scenes and uh, doesn't sort of trouble you so to speak <laughs> it uh, it gets on with it without dropping the frame rate and uh, forcing us to wait for something to update um, the actual lines that show where it's going aren't very good <laughs> they are having a little bit of a fit about the new system but um, you can see uh, the units actually adapt to the terrain profile fairly well um, they're not actually using physics there's no physics at all they don't have rigid bodies and see the uh, dropships is coming back on that, that little mission and we can move around the train as we like but um, certain slopes can't be traversed by certain units so the idea is uh, different units will have different ranges of slopes that they can traverse uh, so you'll end up with fancy units like I don't know, uh, certain types of spiders can go up um, really steep cliffs and things like that um, a drop ship. There's sometimes a little lag when a drop ship uh, lands. I need to work out what that's about, but it, it works, so I, I, I don't worry too much about it right now. Uh, so you really see how the um, the landscape is much more undulating than it used to be. Like it used to be completely flat, and um, I can't say it was very good. And whilst we're here on the surface, um, let's build a base. So uh, the base stuff. When you select uh, a golem, in this case, um, depending on what tool that unit has equipped, it can build certain things. So certain buildings require certain tools in order to be able to select. So this um, this little palette of um, buildings is actually uh, dynamically updated based on what tool you've got. So when you place, you can actually rotate, and so that works on any train level as well, and that allows us to you know, decide the orientation. Um, so what it does, because the um, the new train system required me to basically allow us to alter the foundations for the buildings, because uh, you want the buildings to be flat, um, but the train often isn't now. So you can see just even here, I mean, you know, it looks relatively flat, but actually there is a little bit of variation everywhere you go now. So we're actually flattening the terrain as well. And, um, you can kind of see here where it's cut in with a triangle. It's not always doing it perfectly. Um, but, um, you know, we can place things and it's flattening the ground. Um, and obviously there's a, a limitation there. We can actually only place to a certain uh, distance out. But you can see here, when it's too steep, we can't actually flatten that terrain. Uh, even rotating, as we rotate, it's trying to validate the placement. And if it can't validate, it'll just give up. Uh, so in terms of what we're actually placing here, by the way, I realize I haven't talked about buildings yet. The buildings don't actually do anything. They are just shells of what they are going to be. Um, and you can see that they're just building here automatically. Like the idea is the Golem's going to place the structure and then you'll need to actually deliver the construction vehicle, uh, sorry, the construction resources to that plot. And, um, you know, however you're going to do that with vehicle to it or whether it's attached to a base that can automatically send those things out. And then you either use the golem to build it or you use a, like a drone worker type thing which will do the building process uh, after those things have been delivered. And so what we have here is the staging area. The staging area is essentially like um, the hub of your base or of a very basic base. Uh, it's literally just somewhere where you, like on a construction site, they have a staging area. It's where all the supplies are put um, ready for the vehicles to sort of make use of them people to take all those things and actually use it so they tend to wait for those things to be delivered uh, and that's what the staging area essentially is um, the settlement allows you to move people down um, the generator is a very basic power system and um, I haven't done anything with the the way the power works yet um, but the idea will be it'll be a bit like um, Dyson Sphere program where you actually have to sort of connect up power and buildings without power you know, don't work it's just a way of limiting the sizes of the base and to create a dependency on resources which is you know what you kind of want to do in an rts game <laughs> landing pad um, allows uh, you to basically connect to your space network or your fleet network so if a base is attached 
to um, a fleet or a subset of the fleet uh, you can automatically send ships back and forth as you need to uh, I'll go into that in a second um, there's obviously basic walls you can put the turrets behind the walls and it can fire over it will be able to <laughs> and um, what else have we got the uh, the actual drone worker hub so there's actually three little drone workers already sat on that hub ready to be used but I haven't quite finished that yet uh, so there's stuff in the very latest build I'm working on but this is stuff that's stable and then we've got a refinery which I, I don't really like the look of so I'm probably going to redesign that I kind of based it on real refineries and that's not always a good idea yeah, I kind of think something smaller might be a good idea um, but the the golem can also harvest things so if I move over to this coal over here um, when he gets there I'll show you how the harvesting works and um, we've got another guy down here and you can kind of see I'm trying to just give an, an illustration of the train as I go along uh, and uh, where's my a little bit of cool there he is he's still on the uh, I tried to do like sand dune effect it's it, it kind of worked I think it's alright um, you know it's difficult because um, certain train features can be seen from orbit uh, you wouldn't necessarily see individual sand dunes from orbit but you can't really win you know like with this scale um, so up here we've got another vehicle if I send this guy off I'm trying to fit a lot in and probably not doing a very good job <laughs> and um, see here the, the snowy areas look pretty good like the um, I think it's to do with the way the Sun hits the planet at certain angles you kind of get better normals uh, so what I'm not really showing very well here is that we can actually now move between things all over the place I pause for a second and send these guys to here and then if I send you over there and if I send you over there now I've actually slowed down well have I slowed down I've uh, adjusted things so that ships take a bit longer to move throughout the system you see we get the, the dust effect still um, kind of tried to make it a little bit more realistic how long it takes to sort of move from A to B for the ships um, and the, um, the orbital insertion is a little bit better people were saying it looks really unrealistic the way that ships are moving into orbit but that's kind of by design like I need there to be a choke point next to the planet if you're kind of arcing from a long long way away it's quite possible that you could just skip some turrets that were placed at the entry point uh, or if a fleet was waiting at the end of that war point then you could kind of just go and, uh, and it wouldn't bother you so, <laughs> and I don't want that I want there to be choke points so yeah as you can see this is um, these are the orbital lines I have now. Um, they're a little bit better than they were. Like it's further away from the, uh, the planet when it enters orbit. Um, looks okay. <laughs> Let's uh, then move some things across to. Uh, no, that one's already going. Across to here. And you can see how the ones that I've given waypoints uh, beyond this planet are all, have already waypointed uh, outwards. So that's the orbital line that they follow going uh, across to their next planet. And so let's hop around a bit. I'm taking too much time on one particular planet. Uh, I'm trying to cram a lot in and I'm not doing a very good job. So this is a very Mars-like looking planet. And, um, and I think it looks kind of cool. And so um, we put something down here. Uh, let's go with something a little bit quicker. We can deploy anywhere we like. Uh, it doesn't matter how high up the train is. We can actually deploy even to the top of the mountain right now. So I quite like that. Um, a lot of games will only sort of let you do things on the flat plane, or, or the flat sphere plane thing of the planets. Um, but the train is very much a part of everything it doesn't matter how high it is it's still usable for a base still usable for walking on moving on and for deploying on and all the other things we're going to hopefully better do at some point um, let's 
see we can actually go into the craters uh, just sort of they, you know it doesn't bother the little spider obviously it's a spider you can go anywhere, you can go anywhere. and if we hop down into here you can see this sort of more mountainous sort of rough looking terrain that the buggy is gonna move through set some things going and I just want to illustrate here that we can hop around as we like so this was not actually in um, on my last development diary and it's a very obvious thing to be needed we can literally just hop between units now on different planets and previously we had to go all the way out all the way out all the way in and it looks good um, I'm not complaining but we really needed to just sort of be able to do this and um, just hop around instantaneously and um, nothing to unload nothing to you know worry about it literally just does the job and so over here we can set this guy to harvesting it, it, it the um like the selection system automatically knows what tools can be used to gather resources and in the case of the golem it actually has the right tool which is um, the plasma saw and the plasma saw if we click on uh, a bit of coal here uh, we can actually just sort of dig into it. I admit that um, some of these units do rotate a little bit slowly. Uh, <laughs> not the best. <laughs> but it's kind of realistic, you know? Like, I don't know. So uh, he's approaching. He's going to then walk into it, apparently. Of course. And um, unleash his saw and get on it. And uh, so he's a little bit close, but, you know, he's very safety conscious and you can see the um, the coal is actually going up and uh, if you pay enough attention you'll see that the uh, the cargo space is updating in real time as well now so the inventory system is almost completely functional um, it's just you can't build anything yet like you can't go okay I've got coal and copper I can turn that into uh, copper bars and then those copper bars can be used for electronics and you know much like uh, Dyson Sphere um, that is essentially the way we're going to go so the, you'll gather resources there are quite a lot of different resource types and um, those resources you use to make uh, other materials essentially and uh, you know better things things you need and so I really should be making more effort to show the terrain given that it is the big feature um, the other thing is actually that we can now make groups uh, so if we go back to I just show you here how we can how it handles the craters very nice doesn't seem like much but uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm really happy that I have undulating terrain now like it, it really opens the door and um, what actually does need to be improved here is the camera I never intended that there to be a camera system following the units on the ground and um, it actually has um, it tries to always maintain like galactic north upwards and so like here for example I actually can't rotate and keep it level and yeah you can go under the ground currently but <laughs> that's fine and so you kind of get weird angles with the camera when you're focused on um, a vehicle depending on where it is on the planet like you see here it's now you know it's it's sort of at the equator right so the actual natural camera angle is kind of like this not ideal we're going to need a horizon based camera system that pretty much any uh, pretty much any game that goes on spherical planets would use do so you see these um the rocky planets are still very rocky and not much going on on them generally but you know it's i think it, um, it looks fairly realistic so <laughs> i'm okay with that and um we got other worlds obviously uh just to sort of illustrate how the earth -like planets look now i think the earth -like planets do look a lot lot better i mean you guys will have to tell me um but i you know i'm feeling it i like it and we pop down to here. Okay. yeah the uh other thing i hadn't really gone into was that we can now create groups now generally in an rts game that will mean um assigning to the number keys like one two etc and then you just press that key to get that group now i wanted to take that idea and go a little bit further with it 
So what you can do is if we select this, uh, sorry, let's, let's select the support carry that we, we jumped in with. And we go to the modules, we can promote uh, a leader character as we do here. And what you see is a new group has been created with that leader at the head of that group. And what has also happened is that it has automatically added any of the units that are that consider uh, that unit to be their home unit. The ones that they are normally stored in and then you set them down and then they go back up to that ship. That's their home ship or unit. And so it's automatically added those as well, regardless of whether they're currently on a planet or not. They are actually currently in the hold and uh, they're taking up the the actual storage space and by the way you can do it here as well when it's open and go back to your your parent entity here the idea is this is a little hierarchy of your units aboard that vessel and so we've actually added those but we can also say well all right i want to add if i shift select these and then i control click here we can add them to the group and now that leader is now the leader uh, well the leader of the representative or whatever of those uh, units as well and so we create a grouping if we click on it we can select the entire group if we have um, if we find another vessel here we are and we make that uh, the leader by promoting this is temporary the promo button there you'll actually have to get leaders by going to the factions and then the leader will have an association to a faction and you'll have to juggle all those like loyalties and so it'll pay off ultimately to have leaders of all the different factions and uh, so now we can also select multiple groups and actually sort of alternates the selection there and so if we deselect all of those you can see how we can build a selection and then we can build up the fleet panel and then we can be like well what resources has that group that we've selected got and so these groupings aren't necessarily related to numbers, but you can do that as well. So you'll be able to assign a number to whatever group you want, but you won't necessarily have to assign numbers to the group. So you can have as many groups as you want, as many as you, you're comfortable filling this side page with. And you can just sort of hop between the selections. And so group movement is gonna be based on what groups things are in. So if you have a capital ship and you have a bunch of other ships, it'll know based on the group you're in, how it should arrange itself. So formations are essentially automatic. That's the thinking going forward at least. And um, also in terms of pooling resources and that kind of thing. Uh, bear with me a second. Uh, so you see we just creating a base down here next to this ruined city. I just kind of wanted to highlight that we do have uh, other buildings and features apart from just trees and resources it's just a case of well uh, I, I'm not going to sit and fill out an entire planet with cities it's just too much work right now and I don't need to do that but the idea generally is you know you have these sort of things on the planets as well they won't just be bare at least not at the beginning of the game when you're still in the earth colonies and um, yeah so the idea with the bases and uh, if I sort of come down here and start you know we can build it amongst the sort of city ruins as it's not really limiting us where we build things. Um, yeah, assuming that the train is okay, it goes red when it's not. And if we move over to this higher train over here. I can illustrate how a base can be built there as well. Um, but um, when you build a base, it actually gives it a name, which I think in this case is that one. It's called Alpha, and so when you build other buildings next to it, they become part of that base. So these buildings are part of the Alpha base, um, which <laughs> the um, the main building of Alpha base is apparently a fence. Well, uh, and so, and as you go a certain distance away, when you create another base, it'll give it another name, and then you, uh, buildings next to that will inherit that association that'll be part of another base and the way the bases then work is that they actually sort of support their own network so any any the group I feel like I'm rambling a little bit the group will automatically share items and so you see here now we're on a higher sort of plateau if I start building something here you see it gives it a new name because we're far enough away from alpha for this to be considered a separate base 
and each individual base will share resources automatically to a certain degree and within certain rules that you can set. Gas plants look look like like they feel like gas plants. I think you know they they might not look perfect, but they they are they're big, and you know you take a long time to move around them, and eventually you'll be able to sort of dip into the atmospheric layer itself and actually get resources that way, uh, taking the risk of these sort of the storms as you go down as well. Uh, so I don't want gas plants to be meaningless or just things that you need to move the fleet around. As you can see, they are large. Um, they also have moons. Moons. I haven't done anything with moons yet because uh, I need to fully understand the um, how much sort of CPU and GPU and RAM and that I'm taking up with the base planets, and then tailor the moons so that they're not too, you know, <laughs> they're not too big. Mm. All right. So I think that is everything, and uh, I'm hoping to get back on a more regular regular schedule now. And um, yeah, I hope this has been interesting. <laughs> and um, thanks for tuning in and see you soon.